Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for our art talk for February. Yes, it's February. I keep thinking, oh my gosh, February is almost done. It's kind of crazy. Every year it just goes so fast. It's great to see lots of people are still joining us. Um, so Melanie and I have known each other for several years now, I guess. And um, I was lucky enough to get to hear about these beacons um, that you were creating probably about a year and a half, two years ago, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess. Um, and Melanie did a project with a co-working space in Kelowna called CoLab, and you learned a lot there and you spent some time in New York learning about the technology uh, that went into the development of this project. Yep. Um, and I was really excited from the get go. And I uh, feel really grateful that when you became the artist in residence for the city of Kelowna last year, um, that I was able to participate in the program, as well as I believe several of the people who are on um, part of this conversation tonight. Um, so Melanie also works with the Alternator Gallery, which is located in the Rotary Center for the Arts in downtown Kelowna. And we're really happy to have you here. So welcome, Melanie, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Karma. Thanks, everyone, uh, for joining tonight. Um, I'm going to dive right in here, but um, just before we start, we're a good sized, fair sized group. If you do have any questions during the presentation or anything, you can either throw them in the chat or if you want to just ask them, you can do that too. Um, I think we're a small enough group. We can kind of keep it conversational and stuff as well. Um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction, Karma. Um, I'm going to be presenting on a project that I um, started working on a few years ago um, that had turned into uh, something I worked on as the City of Kelowna's Artist in Residence in 2020. Um, the project for the city was called When It Is Necessary to Stand Still, um, but it's gone through a few different names and iterations. Um, so uh, I think I'll just kind of jump right in. So. I did start this project uh, in 2015 when I was doing my master's at Emily Carr. And it's a pretty tech, um, tech heavy project. Uh, for those of you who might not be from super familiar with it, it includes uh, the production of a collection of beacons uh, such as these, whereby if uh, you have one and I have one and we're within proximity of each other, so um, a few blocks or so, they'll start to glow and they get brighter as we get closer together. Um, but the project, like I said, started out really different. So when I was first looking at um, uh, art, you know, just studying art and doing my graduate studies, I was really interested in uh, looking at public spaces and different ways that we can um, kind of just break down the ways that we interact through public space. Um, how do we, um, how do we connect? How do we kind of uh, create different tactics to kind of break any repetition in our routine um, and create different ways for us to engage really. So this is a work um, called Thread from 2014. It included um, walking around. Uh, well, so I took this yellow or bright fluorescent orange spool of thread and I let it out behind me for about four kilometers as I walked through uh, the west end of Vancouver. The idea of the work was really to, I was thinking a lot about spaces that I move through and other people who are there um, maybe walking the same path as me, but maybe at a different times. So situatedness and temporality, um, kind of the way that we share spaces, uh, missed connections, things like that. And how do we kind of um, play with these things in a, in a playful way? Um, so another work that I wanted to just kind of share with you that's kind of along the same, you know, same idea of looking at public space that I was really interested in uh, is this work by um, an artist named uh, Francis Elise. Um, and he's a Belgian artist who's based in Mexico City now. Uh, but this work is called Paradox of Praxis. 
um, and Elise pushed a large block of ice through the streets of Mexico City for nine hours, the approximate time that it took to melt. It was an intent to, intended to pay homage to street vendors in Mexico City and a reflection on the political realities of the labor as described by Chloe Johnson. At the end of the piece, there was nothing left to show for it but an anonymous pile, puddle of water, one that would, as though belaboring the metaphor of the ephemerality of performance itself eventually evaporate. Um, so those are the kind of works and things that I was thinking about a lot in, in uh, grad school. Um, and then another reference here that fed a lot into my work um, is actually a video game. It's called Journey. Um, and so Journey is a video game whereby a player controls a rogue figure in a vast desert traveling towards a mountain in the distance. Other players of the same journey can be discovered and two players can meet and assist each other, but they cannot communicate via speech or text and cannot see each other's names until after the game's credits. The only form of communication between the two is a musical chime, which transforms dull pieces of cloth found throughout the levels into vibrant red, affecting the game world and allowing for the player to progress through different levels. The developers of Journey sought to evoke in the players a sense of smallness and wonder and to forge an emotional connection between them and the anonymous players that they met along the way. So reviewers of the game praised it for the sense of companionship created by playing with a strange stranger, calling it a moving and emotional experience. Um, so really looking at these ideas of play and everything as well, um, play is something that can really provide a counterpoint to regular responses and reflections reflexes that are considered to be everyday. Um, and it involves actions which are non-instrumental. It creates boundaries that separate it from the everyday and really allow people to test and expand their limits beyond what they would normally do. So all of these things kind of came into play when I was looking at producing the beacon. So um, at this time, I coming out of school, I really just had the idea of the beacons um, really just, it was a concept, a one sheet on paper. And I hadn't really start figuring out the technology or anything like that. Um, so I finished school. I uh, promptly moved to Kelowna and um, that fall, so the fall of 2016, I ended up doing a residency at the Okanagan Collab that, um, Carmen mentioned uh, briefly before. And the, the uh, residency was actually, it was called the Convergent Studios Residency. And it was co-hosted by the Alternator Center for Contemporary Arts, as well as the Okanagan CoLab as a way to bridge uh, arts and technology. Um, I definitely worked with technology uh, in various capacities before but nothing specifically like this. And the collab was really great because the months that I spent there, uh, they provided me with uh, a bunch of different mentors who uh, worked a lot with technology and programming and um, really wanted to be involved in some kind of creative process and project. Um, and it was really great. So um, just before I get into some more of the tech stuff, this was like the first kind of graphic of like, how will the beacons work? So, <laughs> um, and generally we've pretty much stuck to the same thing. Uh, so you've got the stick people that each have uh, beacons and the beacons have GPS. Um, uh, they communicate over, over um, a 3G or a network and uh, all, the, all the communications or all the, um, calculations and math and stuff takes place in the cloud on the server side of things. And uh, the only thing that that the beacons do is transmit their GPS location and receive RGB values. So the beacons aren't actually very smart, but that's all right. We still love them. Uh, this is what the beacons, uh, some of the first um, versions of them, uh, starting on the left, that was the first one. The large black rectangles are actually the first batteries that I've used. Batteries have always been the most, the biggest part and the 
thing I've had the biggest trouble in terms of shrinking down the beacons. Um, uh, in this first version, you can see that has a long stick attached to it, and that stick has a GPS on the end. Um, we were actually a bit worried about interference from the battery to the GPS. Um, that didn't actually end up being a problem. And you can see, uh, you know, how they eventually took form. Um, the one, the circular one that you see on the right hand side, that's um, when I first started to use the circular shape. And that is a snow globe from Michaels. So um, here we are just kind of testing uh, a few artist friends who came to visit. And we took the beacons, like the biggest ones out for brunch one day. Uh, very interested in how people would receive them. They weren't the most um, pretty things out there. And actually they, they looked kind of like bombs. I'll just go back. <laughs> so we were really curious, but um, you know, going to a restaurant, people were like curious, but you know, no one's that felt threatened or anything. So that was good. <laughs> um, what else can I say? Yeah. Do, do, do. Just some more photos uh, as we started kind of testing them. This is kind of by our house just off of Valley Road, Valley and Summit. Kind of there's a big field there. Um, and so um, this is just some testing of some earlier prototypes. And this is a video um, that kind of demonstrates this is kind of the first prototype test that we did. Um, my brother Mackenzie and his partner. Uh, have starred in all of my beacon prototyping videos so far. And <laughs> I really appreciate it. But yeah, you can see in this one, the, the light is blue. And then as soon as they got to 250 meters, uh, the, the light turned yellow. And the intensity of the light, as you can see, as they get closer together, uh, the light becomes brighter. So yeah. It's hard to say, see, because it's daylight, but um, yeah, the intensity did go up. Hey, yay, okay. <laughs> so this is, um, yeah. So that was kind of a big milestone for the beacons, getting them to this point. I made about three prototypes like this. And then um, I took a little break actually for a while. It was kind of, um, just focusing on some other parts and um, yeah, it kind of fell onto the back burner for about a couple of years. So between 2016 and 2018, I was doing a bit of finessing with programming and stuff like that, um, but it was a bit of a break um, until um, I went to New York. And so I'll, I'll jump into that, but a lot of my time when I was in New York was spent really looking at what the shells are going to look like because um, I had the insides mostly figured out and the technology. Um, but it's weird having an art project that I've been working on without actually knowing what it was looking like until the later stages. Um, so the dodecahedron is the shape that I eventually landed on. Um, and it is uh, a 12 faced shape. So it's made up of 12 pentagons. Um, they it's one of five platonic solids. Um, and it has a very long history in art, architecture, math and philosophy. Uh, so for instance, Plato thought that the dodecahedron was the shape of the universe uh, with the 12 pentagons representing the 12 constellations. Um, and also in uh, modern role-playing games, uh, the regular dodecahedron is often um, used as a 12-sided die. So um, once again, thinking about games um, and bringing it back into that realm with people using it. And it has that reference uh, for some, I think, especially uh, folks who might play Dungeons and Dragons. Apparently, they have a lot of dodecahedrons. Um, so these are a couple of the first uh, dodecahedrons that I made when I was uh, just testing out. The first one on the left there is made of just acrylic that was cut on a laser cutter. Um, the second one is when I decided I wanted to make them out of wood. But actually when I was in New York, uh, I was feeling a bit homesick and I was really, I wanted to make them out of cedar. It was hard to find cedar down there. 
Um, so I just, on the left here, you can see I made one with just random wood and I tried to stain it. It didn't quite have the same effect. Um, and then the middle one you can see is the one that I did end up making out of cedar. Um, and then the one on the right has was 3D printed. So there's been quite a few different versions of them. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just here's an image. Um, the cedar ones, I ended up sourcing the cedar locally at a local mill. And there's a the process of CNC um, cutting it. So the process of cutting it um, is computerized. So there's the shells, what they look like. Um, actually, sorry. So um, yeah, but I was gonna, when we move forward a few slides, there'll be images of um, a 3D rendering or like uh, the shells that are made out of in, um, a, a, was it? Autodesk Fusion, so a modeling program. Uh, and that's how these were cut into the wood. So the design is programmed in and then the machine cuts it. So uh, that's that. Um, this is just uh, an image of the space that I worked in in New York. It's called the Fat Cat Fab Lab. It was a maker space and it was uh, all sorts of different artists, architects, um startup folk hackers you name it who just kind of it was like a merry little gang of makers and it was a lot of fun and i spent uh a, a good chunk of fall 2018 there i was back there in spring of 2019 and then fall of 2019 again working on the beacons really working on the shape and um you know those three um Beacons there were, yeah, just working the working prototypes that I was playing with and bringing around with me everywhere. Um, there you can see them in the two different spaces. Um, well, the collab on the left, and then I think that's actually not the collab, but um, doesn't matter. But you can kind of see, yeah, working in them in New, uh, working on them in New York, and then uh, oftentimes I'm sure Karma saw me. Other folks who work out of the collab saw me with these beacons. Um, I sure did. Yeah. <laughs> you were like, you wanted, you wanted me to hold one. I remember you handing it to me. Oh, <laughs> it was super fun. Thank you Yay. for that. You're welcome. Yeah, and actually, like pre-COVID, um, I was hoping to have the shells made out of uh, cedar. Um, but when I was making this was like when everything was shut down. And so I had to figure out how to make them from home. So this is just um, me testing it. Uh, the makerspace, the Fat Cat Fab Lab is uh, located in Greenwich Village. So um, yeah, here's me just kind of taking it for a walk. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun taking it through the neighborhood. Um, the colors actually were really interesting with the cedar. Um, because it picked up a lot more of the red hues in it and stuff. So that could have been actually more of like a white light. Uh, it was interesting too, like you couldn't see any purple or green light as well through those ones. So uh, just another image. Um, yeah. So yeah, so when I got, uh, found out I was going to be the city's artist in residence, I had to really figure out how to changed my original plan so I could make the beacons at home. I didn't have a 3D printer at home and I didn't have a CNC machine. So um, what I did do is I got actually one of the folks that I did work with who is one of my mentors um, back in 2016 and I'm still in touch with, he printed out um, some models for me. So on the left, you can see the 3D model that I created. Um, and of, of half a shell. And I also uh, had him print out just basic, the small uh, pentagons as well. I used those. Um, I created silicon molds. Uh, from the silicon molds, I poured resin. So the white things are, or white pentagons or the transparent pe pentagons are made out of resin. And then I use those to build the beacons. So, 
yeah, it ended up being a much longer process, but it was COVID. And actually it turned into me working, I'm still working with resin nowadays. So um, it kind of turned into a new thing for me. So um, inside the beacons, we have a few different parts. So um, the shell, obviously, um, we've got GPS antennas. The, so it helps, this is actually, uh, I had to upgrade the antenna. So this is the same kind of antenna that you have for um, car GPS systems. Um, you've got an antenna for cellular, you've got the particle uh, boron. So this I consider to be like the head and the heart of the beacon. So it's a cellular enabled chip um, and it's what helps send the information up and bring down the information to and from the beacon and connect it to the network. Um, you've got the GPS and you've got NeoPixels, which are programmable LED lights. A LiPo battery, I've been able to reduce the size significantly from where I had started with. Um, and then the key or G wireless receiver. So this is what I, uh, we put in the bottom for the wireless charging. Um, and then the proto board. So, and then when everything's kind of put together, um, this is without the lights, but you can kind of see how it all fit together. It was really an interesting process because in reality, these are bespoke handmade electronics. And I really have an appreciation now for like how much work goes into like soldering everything and like, um, you, you know, just building, building things, making sure it works, troubleshooting, fixing loose wires, all like everything it's just incredible like I have such a an, appre an appreciation and I'll like yeah our phones are pretty amazing our earbuds are pretty amazing I look at electronics with a lot more awe now <laughs> um here's just a bit of my process uh as I was working I really had um I guess six weeks to eight weeks I think I originally had six weeks and it was extended to eight weeks to put everything together. There was a few shipping delays just with COVID um, getting things. Um, batteries, um, I had to reorder um, magnets. I had to kind of get from a few different sources. All the kind of shipping uh, issues that folks were having around the world um, were impacting this project too, but I managed to get everything and uh, yeah put it all together. So it was, um, it was a lot of work, <laughs> but it all came together. Um, I think here I was, I'm, yeah, checking my phone and putting beacons together. Yeah, putting in the magnets maybe. I think that's what I was doing at this point. Um, on the right hand side, you can see there, there's a giant um, like pink thing with a ball on top of it. I was simultaneously planning for a show at the Kelowna Art Gallery, um, which um, if we have some time, I'll share some images of that as well. So it was just, um, I, I really took over a full space in the house with resin and electronics for a couple months. Um, just go to the next slide. Oh, I think I started again. All right. Um, so once they're all put together, this is really uh, generally what they look like um, on their own. There's me being cool in my hallway uh, with a beacon. Um, yeah, and so they work, they all came together. This is, I think, the night before the activation, the first activation, just doing some finishing touches and uh, making sure that everything worked. It was actually kind of scary. Just before this, I had only ever really tested three. And I was hoping to be able to do like some pre small tests. Um, but I, you know, ran out of time. And just with COVID, pulling people together to do large kind of group activities like that was a bit more challenging. So the first activation was really kind of like the first test of having them all out there. Um, and it, you know, 
as we all know, it went really well. Um, but yeah, so this is the plan of what Kelowna, um, the kind of engagement map that I had put together. So generally, uh, I, I picked a circumference of about, or an area of about eight kilometers. If you're familiar with Kelowna, so eight kilometers is generally approximately from City Park to Rutland, uh, also from Gyro Beach to Knox Mountain Park. So I figured that provided a good um, overlay of, of the city and most people who would be engaging would be in and out or around this area um, of Kelowna throughout their days. So um, yeah, this is actually a video my wrap up video. So it kind of shows the whole process. So I'll play this. It's not very long, it's like a minute. Oh, sorry guys, I'll unmute. And I'll start again. Hey, Melanie, we can't hear it. Oh, you can't hear it? No, okay. when you need to go into your audio settings and just okay. um, share desktop and, and then we should be able to hear it. Okay, sorry guys. Do, do, do. Part of the art of it. This is fabulous, Melanie. Um, got um, MacBook Air speakers. Try that one. Oh, I can't see what you're seeing. Okay, hold on. Can you guys hear that? No. All right, hold on. Um, so in Zoom, yeah, Melanie, yeah, you need to just check your video settings. So when it where it says video for you, you click into the arrow there. Yeah, and if, I believe if you go to video settings, okay, then it's going to show you audio. Yeah, audio. Okay, so um. I have my headphones in, maybe that's a problem. Okay, well, it's just background music, so I'm gonna <laughs> just talk over it. Okay, sounds good. Sorry, guys. <laughs> All right. So uh, generally, this is just an overview of my whole process. Um, yeah, and so uh, yeah, those those are all the beacons that were um, in production. Uh, there's uh, at one of the uh, beacon pickup and drop offs. Beacon going home for a weekend. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting from a lot of feedback that people had was just the. Um, the impact that it had during COVID for a lot of folks. Oh, I think I want to start again. Sorry, guys. So um, folks who had the beacons ended up taking them out, taking them on different adventures around town, um, doing all sorts of things with them. It was really fun to see the photos and stuff that people shared. Um, and some of the stories, like the anecdotal stories that people had, um, I think some of the most powerful feedback that I got was that the beacons, um, some folks shared that they struggled, they were struggling with anxiety due to COVID or um, just um, in general, and that the beacons helped them feel grounded and feel more um, connected to community. So that was really nice, just really coming into this project hoping and like really posing a hypothesis that these things are gonna help people feel more connected and that being validated through the work um, in such a strong way was really important just like, cause I do have a more of a like research-based practice. So just, you know, from that point of view but then just really the impact that it had for folks and um, yeah, it was, it made the project all that more special. And um, I feel like I had a real 
um, amazing connection with all the different participants and a lot of people came back and participated multiple times and had um, family members who participated and um, there's often times where uh, folks would come or one person would come and pick up the beacon and a, their whole family would come and drop it off and they'd have a whole bunch of questions and so there was a really great opportunity to share um, and just learn and have some really great connections with the community. There's the mayor with his beacon. So I just thought I'd throw that there in there. <laughs> um, yeah, Colin Vassaran had one. He brought his kids and it was great to kind of teach them a little bit how it worked and show them. And um, yeah, I think he had Julia, um, if anyone is interested. Can you tell um, us about how you decided to name them? Yes, I have a slide about that. Awesome. So I I'll love that, that story. Um, but there's, uh, yeah, so it was great just seeing like the different uh, ways that people would uh, use the beacons and take them out. Um, I'm actually going to get out of this for a second and I'm going to show you. Uh, uh, here we go. So one of the participants did this amazing time-lapse video as well of them taking the beacon for a car ride around town. This is during like one of the first couple activations and uh, just, you know, to see and try and make it change color and activate other people's beacons. So you did have some folks who were really um, like, um, some folks were just at home and used their beacon as an item of comfort um and other people were really motivated to take it out and they used it as a, a motivation to get out and to do more stuff and to like um try and connect with others so they were really more about um playing i guess or activating others so if that if that makes sense so i just want to kind of share that as well um and now i'll go back to presentation oh my god Yeah, so that was great. So every day waking up and there's new photos that were shared, people sent some cards. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, like I mentioned before too, at the pick up and drop off, uh, it was a really great time to share uh, um, and just have some educational stations set up. So this is kind of an example at the Rotary Center for the Arts um, where I had a, a beacon pick up I think set up there and then I had a second table that was for the uh, education so I had some the different kind of prototypes of all the beacons set up I had one that was working where people could kind of see the insides um, and see how it worked and then on the computer people could see the live stream of the data um, as it was moving um, and just compare what was happening with the data that was going through um, and just before I dive into some of the data and the back end kind of stuff. Um, so the naming. So on the left, you'll see that's some of the code. Um, and as I was developing it, so a lot of this work was taking place um, 2016, 2017, kind of that I was working on this. I was listening to a lot of um, this podcast called The History of Rome hosted by Mike Duncan. If you're ever interested in Rome or if you have trouble sleeping, that's how I started to listen to it. It's like in 492, this happened. Anyways, uh, I started to make my name, my various um, versions of code after Roman emperors. Um, so the version that the beacons were running was Tiberius, if you're curious. Um, and so when it came to naming the beacons, I figured I should name it after women of Rome. So all the beacons were named after different women. Uh, the thing I didn't really realize, um, like a lot of people brought them home and they started to research these women, which was awesome. But the women who were remembered often were remembered because they had like horrific histories. So anyways, that was interesting, but still like people were really excited and they um, 
really some people who had their uh, beacon, they'd come back and they'd say, oh, I, I'd like to have Antonia again, or I, I want to have uh, La Villa. I had La Villa or Julia. My grandma was named Julia or something like that. So people either had an affinity uh, for their beacons or they really wanted to have the same beacon again, which is, which is really nice. People form connections with their beacons. Um, this is an example of what the data looks like when it's coming through. So for example, you see the name of the beacon, you see Alice um, you know, is 11 meters away, Brett is six meters away and both are eight meters away. So we're, these ones, um, just as these ones measured the full distance away, it gave the color based on the cumulative uh, distance divided by the number of beacons that were out there. So all the beacons would be the same color for the most part. Um, and this is also the information that was collected as data and archived. So um, there's no personal information that's attached to it. It's really just uh, the name of the beacon, the color, um, uh, and the GPS coordinates. And this information, it was recorded every minute that the beacons were activated. Um, so this is, I've always kind of been thinking about the data in terms of ways that it could be visualized. This is actually a visualization that I did a few years ago, like maybe in 2015 with sensor data just from my phone from walking around for about eight hours in Kelowna. So um, you can see here that you've got the different axes and then that's translated into the abstracted like color lines that you see on the right. There's another example, looks different. Um, and I guess this third one really kind of shows it. So um, my parents, uh, this was me, I was at my parents' place for most of the day, good eight hours. And I think I left the house once and I drove downtown and I picked up my husband and I drove back up. And that is that blue line right at the top here. So it's interesting just how you see that stuff is visualized or like the color change through just that little movement. Um, and so now that I have these different sets of data um, and we have, you know, folks who've kind of moved around Kelowna, how can that become a platform for other types of creativity? Um, and how can we use it to kind of better understand the way that we move or um, move around? Like, how can we glean other types of information? So beyond doing more activations or, um, you know, kind of carrying on, this is another branch of the project that I'm, I'm looking at and I'm interested in doing. And I've been, um, yeah, just figuring out how to do that. I think the best way for it is to do it as an open source. Um, that means that the data would be available to other folks to use, including participants in the, uh, in the project. Uh, as well as the general public. So there's different processes of cleaning data that need to take place, of um, just um, you know going through a whole bunch of privacy things. So all that stuff is kind of being researched and kind of happening right now. Um, so watch this space, I guess. And then the other thing that I'm kind of moving ahead with right now uh, as well, I mentioned before I'd started working with resin a lot more because of COVID, uh, 2020 was the summer of resin for me. And so I've started making uh, just these dodecahedrons um, from resin. So this is this took about six weeks to pour. Um, all the different layers take about three weeks, or sorry, three days to dry. And then uh, I did some more kind of um, po polishing and sanding to make it extra shiny. So I'm, planning to do a collection of these, this, of 12 of these this year. Uh, I've made, I've got two poured and one that's fully been polished. And then I'm also, oh, sorry. Don't wanna oh, Lenny, these are amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, so we have a few questions that have come in. So I just wanted to remind people if they have questions, um, you can put them in the chat and uh, I'll help make sure Melanie See yeah. Those. Yeah. Perfect. I love okay. Shauna says that she loves them. I love them too. 
Oh, thanks guys. And uh, I still have not been on your Patreon page. No worries. <laughs> but I, I'm going to go. So I, I'm going to, I have, I have some questions. We have some questions um, submitted. And of course I have more questions. Cool. Um, so maybe you want to walk us through just, a, you know, a little bit more and then we can uh, yeah, so this was actually like my last slide of the presentation Great. was just that I was I'm, I'm also pouring like these little things, um, just pentagons every day. Um, I've kind of gotten to this nice routine of like pouring resin every day. So um, I don't know, maybe there'll be currency. <laughs> I don't I know. It. But um, yeah, so it's a lot of fun. I've got a yeah. Anyways, um, and if we have more time after, I can show you some other projects and stuff. But um, I'm gonna stop sharing now, and we'll do questions. All right. Awesome. Well, um, I know Colleen had submitted some questions. Sure. Colleen, would you like to um, turn on your video and and ask Melanie, or or would you like me to? Pose those. There you are. Hi, Colleen. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? Good. Um, yeah, just some really simple questions. I was curious um, at the beginning there, I had asked in the chat, what demographic has been most interested in your project? Like, is it men, women, what ages? Um, definitely in the, it, it, the different parts have different uh, demographics for for sure when I was building the beacons it was certainly in a very male dominated uh, even like the collab mostly all my mentors on that project were guys down in New York in that maker space uh, it was mostly all guys I was working with but definitely you know also on that tech space um, but then uh, it for the activations it was certainly more uh, women uh involves um i'm because gonna say it's really appealing do you think or um i feel like um kind of a nurturing thing where you've got this the connection thing, thing. Or... like i feel like the women women uh, just to generalize women kind of maybe got it uh, just maybe the connection side of it a bit more where um you know, and there would often be times where the women would come and they'd pick up the beacon and, um, but when they came to drop it off, their husbands would come with them and stuff, but the husbands would have questions about the data and stuff like that. So, you know, there's something for everyone, really. Um, but yeah, everyone had different entry points. Um, it, and uh, yeah, teachers, um, but really lots of students there was no like one specific age demographic I had participants of all ages um a few youth who had their parents sign up for them um high school students university students university teacher you name it so there yeah oh karma I would say Melanie like my son who's seven Corbin um he was super fascinated and I think I sent you some photos of him and I together yes. and like, he wanted to have them in the bedroom, which I actually realized once they were in the bedroom, I have to admit, cause I'm not sure I told you about this. I had this, like one of those, oh my gosh, my father shuts off his wireless every night because he doesn't want the wireless signals around him. And I've heard lots of different people talking about their sensitivity to wireless signals. And this was like my moment of like paranoia and anxiety in the middle of COVID with this thing in my room. What is going on with these wireless signals? So I was, it was fascinated <laughs> what types of things I was started to think about. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's really interesting. Just a lot of the conversations that folks had around the beacons, um, a lot of them around the dinner table, around a lot of them revolved around the data like people curious about that um, and like just kind of privacy, but it was good to be able to show folks, you know, like understanding, like, and this idea of like object oriented ontology. So this is an object, it has its own thing, but it's not connected to you. You're giving it meaning on its own. It doesn't have meaning. It's really just a lamp without community. 
right? So looking at that, um, a few conversations around how is this art or where does the art live in it? So yeah, I guess it's sculptural, it's a light, there's design elements. There's also performative elements with um, how uh, folks were moving around with them um, and causing lights to shift for others. Um, and kind of this collective kind of hue that was being created. Um, yeah, and then as a platform for other types, like the data can now be used as another type of creative project again. So yeah, that, that's interesting too. And uh, there's a lot of people who weren't necessarily artists or in, interested in art who got into the project because you know it was like a social activity or they're interested in technology. Um, and so it was kind of an entry point to art in a different way for them. Yeah, yeah. And your explanation of the project as you were going through the slides, um, it struck me because you referenced the video game yes. early in the project. And it, for me, you know, I have learned about your project at the same time I've kind of really been introduced to video games through my child because I had like just a, a few video games, for instance, like Commodore 64 video games when I was a kid, but then didn't yeah. have anything except, you know, Tetris once in a while. And the yeah. way that you went through it and referenced the video game journey um, did make me think about the gamification of different things mm -hmm. you know, going on around us and in our lives. And I thought yeah. that was really fascinating. And it's not like, it's not a, like, I don't play a lot of games, but it's really looking at this idea of play as a way to kind of break ourselves out of like our everyday routine and repetition mm -hmm. and like kind of playful tactics and connecting with others. Like play gives us permission to do things that we wouldn't do in our regular day to day. And that's definitely talking about talking to strangers. Yeah. Or and with people, in a, think, you know, yeah. And looking at doing that in a, in a way that isn't threatening. You, you have permission to do that within a game context. I think it also, because we had two, in the, two of them in our house for uh, some of those activations, right? Mm -hmm. I often would come at the very end of the activation time for people to pick them up and we would chat and, you, and there was a time you were like, do you want to take another one? And I, and I had both of them and, and my husband um, took one of them to work with him and I was yeah. working from home. So it was this interesting like interaction that kind of we were having with each other, each having one. And, and our son was just super wanting to have both of them around him. So it was super fascinating and, and sharing the cards like with my, with my son's teacher. I was like, Corbin, take this to school, tell your teacher about the project. And he was like yeah. so excited about it. He wanted to bring one to school. And because of COVID, I said, no. Uh. There was a few that made it to schools, which, and, and they, I was a little nervous, but they ended up being fine. You know, it all worked out, but yeah, karma, karma figured out if you come at the end, sometimes there were people who would no show and there'd be beacons left over. <laughs> so uh, there were, I had a, a, a few folks who, who knew that trick would kind of come at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Any beacons left? Okay. It was a good trick. Yeah. All right, let's see our, what questions, demographics. Yes, um, are there any other questions? I'm just wondering how many people have um, tested them so far? And did that meet your expectations or was it more than, or did you have a certain goal for how many people you wanted to test in a certain time frame? Um, yeah, well, or like, or just like having the activations, like before I started, I had three made that I had like tested ahead of time. But um, throughout this, I had, I didn't, my goal was to have 250 people. And I, I didn't have quite that many who participated just because of some people who dropped out, or, you know, like, but um, yeah, definitely a couple hundred folks who participated in the project. Um, and my goal is to keep building the project. So um, I'm applying for different funding, you know, uh, through different calls um, and such to do different activations. And I wanna keep building the collection. 
um, and keep doing activations that aren't necessarily maybe just in one community, but maybe there's a community, you know, maybe it's Kelowna and Montreal, or maybe it's Kelowna and another city. And you have, you know, so expanding it uh, in terms of geography, but then just like continue to building the collection. So hopefully the next collection that I, you know, next activation, I get some funding, I'm able to build more beacons and um, that'll allow me to, you know, have a hundred out at once, you know, in a few years, they'll be all over the world, who knows? I don't know. <laughs> so Melanie, I have a question. I know that I brought up to you that I could see kind of how they could be integrated into performative work. Yeah. And, you know, potentially working with dancers who could have them and, you know, have, have them on a network and have some kind of an experience from an audience, but also that the dancers are the dancers and the, are an extension of the beacon in yeah. a way, right? And how does that play together and how can you play with space and, and record that and share that with um, more people in the community? I'm yeah. fascinated by them. <laughs> yeah, there's so many, like I, this last, like the activation went well, that was really just, it opened up so many op options and possibilities for where can I go next in terms of um, different types of collaborations, uh, different types of workshops. I know there's a lot of interest in folks being able to have their own, make their own. So I'm looking at ways to make it um, accessible for people to make their own beacons. Um, right now, the hardware, not including the shelves, it's about $300 per beacon. So it's not super accessible or like right now. So I'm trying to figure out how, different ways that I can reduce the cost and make it easier for people to, to build. Um, it's interesting because the more you kind of simplify it for the building, the more that you take away the educational stuff. Like I can get a proto board made with all the stuff on it but then you're not hooking up your own GPS or you know what I mean? Like, so what, where does that lie? in terms yeah. of what what's the point yeah you you had been planning a workshop I believe that was mm -hmm. going to happen with in partnership with the Kelowna Art Gallery so yeah. people could build oh. lamps yeah right and I yeah. remember I was really interested in it and I think that it's been postponed because of COVID yeah yes um but when I started to learn about the technology from you I started to get interested in the accessibility of building your own something. And, yeah. you know, it was around the same time my son would, he would just, he would see all kinds of random technology, old phones, old computers, old, all kinds of technology. And he would say, can I have that? I'm going to save it for my console because he's planning on building his own game console. Yeah. And I was, I started just to think about all of these pieces of technology that don't even work anymore in my house and the idea of like upcycling them. And I was like, eh, I bet you can't do that. But I started to have these thoughts around the technology and then started to like when the library reopened going into the tech, uh, sorry, the, the magazine section, seeing these tech magazines that would have like you know, a, a Raspberry Pi on the front and how to DIY Raspberry Pi. And I, I started thinking about technology and art a lot more because of what I knew about your project. Yay. And making it more tech, making that technology and like not being scared of what's inside it. Yeah. And knowing that it's not like this totally, that you can't do it, right? Um, yeah was really cool and I think it made it more accessible to experience it through you and your experience just exploring this what does it do yeah do it, this? yeah and it's still like I feel like I have a lot of very specific knowledge like I know how to program these beacons I know how to make a dodecahedron you know like <laughs> um 
so it's interesting. So there's a lot of room to expand, um, but I, that's another reason I'm really interested in collaborating with this project. Like if, if there are folks who are, and there's been a few university students and such have reached out who've been like, I, I'm curious, I just wanna do stuff related to this. Um, and I wanna do some research related to it. I'm like, go for it. Like everything's on GitHub. I want to make sure it's as open source as possible. Like it wouldn't be a project without community. And also thinking about the way I'm setting up the data. Like there's so many different ways. Like people are like, oh, if you, you can monetize the data, you can do this. And it's like, well, that really goes around away from the ethos of the project. But if it was fed back in, into adding more value to the project in different ways, that's really more of what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And so making it as a creative platform and a community resource, you know, uh, if someone is like, I want to collaborate on a shell that's a triangle instead of a dodecahedron, I'd be like, great. Like there's, I, I, in my lifetime, I don't think I'll ever be able to like pick apart all the different pieces and questions that come out of this. So yeah. yeah. It, when, um, when social media is being criticized in terms of its ability or not ability to actually connect people. I have thought about this project as being really so simple, but you know, people, as people said to you about their anxiety and being able to feel some comfort mm -hmm. from this as an item, um, it made me think about how we are connected to each other. And I know that when I had it in the house, it really had me thinking about what are those other people doing? Where are they? Yeah. You know, how are they moving around in the community? So it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yay. Um, and I am trying to figure out how to make them more accessible to the general public, like either through rental, like <laughs> they're not, uh, I'm not ready to sell them yet just because like they're still very much, prototypes as well right like the insides for a good part of them were being held together you know soldered but there were some elastic bands involved you know so <laughs> I do want to make sure that they're um before they're so like if they need they need to be improved a little bit um and just figuring out doing updates and stuff but I am working on different ways to make them uh uh rentable so just mm -hmm. figuring out the logistics around that for folks to be able to take them home. And then if I do need to like recall them for a different activation or tune up or if something happens, I can easily fix it. Um, so I was hoping to have them available or some available this month, but um, I'm a bit behind, apologies. But if people are interested in renting them, let me know. I am starting a small list of folks um, who notified me that they're interested and I'll, you know, let you know. How much Hopefully. do you think you'll be charging for the, for the rentals? Uh, it'll probably be about $35 around there. Um, so each of the beacons has their own data plan too. So like they all have their own little cell phone plan. So uh, rental cost covers like the data plan and all that stuff too. So, um, yeah, and then I just, I'll share it as well. I do have um, a Patreon page with a small dedicated team of patrons uh, who've been helping me um, over, you know, I started this last just December of 2019. I started the Patreon page um, and a lot of folks have, you know, a small but mighty team of folks has really helped me you know, with paying some of the cell phone fees, you know, as, you know, and just kind of those maintenance costs for the project to keep it going, um, just as I've been kind of working through it and, and they've been along for the journey. So, um, and then I'll also, I guess, share my webpage here too, if people are interested. Um, yeah, and there's more information about some of my other projects and stuff on here as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, onwards and upwards. 
Very cool. Very cool. I love this project. Yay. Thanks, Camera. Um, we are at 8.33. So um, I probably could stay and talk to you. And if you have a few more minutes, Melanie, I would totally stay and talk to you. Um, but I just want to check in if there's anyone else that has any questions. I don't have a question, but I was just going to say that I also loved this project and it was really fun to participate um, when I did. Although I was one of those people that didn't leave my house. Like it just so happened that day because I was working from home and it, you know, it didn't happen. But it was still kind of, it was fun to have it around and like see the changing colors and stuff. Um, so I enjoyed that a lot. And also seeing everybody else's, like when they were posting and stuff, that was really, that was really interesting. Like that connection thing. Um, I really, I really found that, um, you know, kind of something that made it special. Yeah. Yay. I'm so, it, this just makes me so happy to get all this, this feedback and to be able to share it with you guys. Cause um, like I said, it was like, it's a simple idea, like, but it was just like, is it going to make people feel more connected? There's no way to test it until you kind of put it out into the world, right? So, um, yeah, it was really validating, like, five years of work was, was worth it, so. I, I think it's also really interesting because um, Kelowna is so connected to the tech sector, Mm -hmm. that it seems so fitting um, that you are here and doing it here. And I know part of it is um, your partner, husband, also works kind of in the tech industry in an arts, like you. Yeah. Yeah. Arts he's tech, which is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of what brought us to Kelowna. So he's in the animation industry. So he moved out here when his studio opened up uh, out here. Um, and, uh, yeah, but we, he's also an artist. He's, you know, we met at the BAMP Center. He worked at the NFB for a bit. And, um, so he understands kind of the artistic and the creative process and everything. And, uh, yeah, he's been there for all my ramblings around this project and stuff, but yeah, the, I guess the, uh, there was two pillars that the project, um, the city of Kelowna wanted work that responded to social inclusion and innovation as their two pillars. And so like, I couldn't not apply, so. I know, <laughs> and I remember um, I was kind of in conversation with a few other artists who were contemplating um, submitting projects for this and uh, didn't end up doing so. And I didn't know that you were applying. And when I found out you were the selected artist, I was just like, oh, I was so excited. And, and yeah, it, it just turned out so great. On that note, I think the call for the 2021 Cities Artists and Residents opened yesterday. It so sure did. it sure did. So um, yeah, definitely check that out. Um, if you're an artist that's based in the Okanagan. Yeah, it was a great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, hey. it's, it's so fabulous. Okay, um, thank you so much, Shauna, for that question. Um, is there anyone else left who has any questions? Not sure, lots of people are saying Thank you, Chloe, Colleen, um, Michelle. So I'm just I'm gonna do a little wrap up, and then you know we can still take more questions if anyone else has more. Um, but uh, Colleen, who was here earlier and asked a question, is the executive director of the Rotary Center for the Arts, and um, this art talk series was her idea, as we were. Uh, dealing with what COVID was presenting us. And I remember, and she doesn't know this, so I'm just going to tell her this for the first time now too. When she, when she said, let's do this, at first I thought, she's crazy. What is going on? And then I thought, no, I have to, I just got to go with it. I got to help her. I got to do whatever she needs. This is her idea. And um, Colleen, thank you for accepting my suggestions 
uh because Melanie you're one of the people that I was like let's try and do this with Melanie and and that idea came to me you know as I was in the activations in October right um was it in October September when was it September and October September uh 10th to October 24th I think was the last one or maybe October 16th I don't know yeah. yeah, and around that time, I think we we had just kind of gotten it started, and Michael V. Smith um, from UBC uh, presented, and partway through that presentation, I thought, oh, God, Colleen's going to fire me, and then after, she, she was like, no, that was great, and so I was like, okay, let's have Melanie now, <laughs> and uh, this, this was much different, much safer. <laughs> than Michael V. Smith, who I love dearly and is a fabulous artist. Did you, you um, did a reading? Different. Um, there was a point he said, if there's kids in the room, they shouldn't be listening anymore. Okay. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and we, we, did, we didn't put that warning label on the sign up, so. <laughs> yes, uh, which thank goodness we did. Um, but this, this was great. And so Colleen, uh, if there's, is there anything else that you would like to add? No, I'd okay. like to thank you, Melanie for, for your time and sharing your, your journey with us. Um, it was, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And to everybody that, um, joined us here tonight, thank you very much for, uh, for coming and, uh, taking part in our art talks. And, uh, we're just lining up our next four months of art talks. We've got some fabulous speakers um, coming up and uh, hope that you can join us again and pass the word along to others. This, um, the art talks are the last Tuesday of every month. And um, yeah, we started as part of our RCA at home program last March, Mar March slash April. And uh, yeah, it's been growing. So I'm really, really pleased. But uh, thanks again, everyone. Thanks for hosting it. It's uh, so great. Yeah, it's awesome. Great. And next awesome. month, we don't have all the details we don't have all the details yet, but next month um, we will be having an artist who is in the theater uh, realm. And uh, he's mostly worked in Vancouver, but has done some work with some local theater groups, um, one of them being Mad Fox Theater. So some people might be familiar with them. And his name is Christopher Waddell, and he has been invited um, and will be speaking with Ilana, who is one of my colleagues. Um, I have the great pleasure to also work for the Rotary Center for the Arts, and uh, I briefly worked at the Alternator uh, many years ago, and the Alternator has come a long way and is doing so many amazing projects, and it's great that you also get to work with them and help support art in our community. Thanks, everyone. Take, take care. Right. Thank Bye. you. Good night, Bye. everyone. Thanks for coming.